Hello and welcome to Orwellian, the podcast dedicated to the essays of George Orwell. When you hear the word Orwellian, what do you think of? Terrifying dystopias? State surveillance? The loss of personal freedom? We think of tea, pubs and the common toad. Join us and we'll tell you why. Welcome everyone. My name is Lewis and I'm here with my co-host, Simon. Now, Simon, what goes into the cup first, tea or milk? <laughs> that is a, a very good question, Lewis, and I'm glad that's the first question you ever asked on our Orwellian <laughs> podcast. Of all the issues we're going to discuss regarding what George Orwell wrote. It's, it's a key issue, <laughs> I think. And we will come to it today. We will definitely come to it, and I'll give you my answer later. But um, as you can gather from your question there, you asked me to choose the first essay that we're going to discuss. And I have chosen a nice cup of tea. Nice cup of tea, uh, which I believe was published in the uh, Evening Standard. It was the Saturday essay in the Evening Standard, 12th of January, 1946. Why did you choose that one? I chose it because I think as we can surmise from your introduction, when people think of Orwell, they think of this dystopian future of a totalitarian society. He he was quite near list when he looked at the future of the mm. world. But so I wanted to choose an essay where which showed that he was actually a really funny guy who was just as stuck in the mundane as the rest of mm. us. And for him, as as we'll discuss in the podcast, making a cup of tea was a big deal. Yes, and I think you know, when I read this essay again, this is one of those essays that you read a, a blurb on the back of a book of Orwell essays, and it says, this man wrote about the surveillance society before it began, and he, he predicted a terrifying dystopia, and he, he took on the Soviet Union at a time when so many intellectuals were fawning over Stalin. Oh, and he also wrote funny essays about pubs and tea. But I, I, reading this essay, I actually think this is this is pure Orwell, and it actually touches on a lot of the themes that were important to Orwell. So uh, we'll come to that later, I suppose. Um, I, I think to start off, let, let's let's put it into some context first. Mm. I mean, at, at the time of recording this podcast, it's twenty twenty one, and this was written on the 14th of January, 1946. Mm. So we have to say, this is post-World War II, or almost immediately post-World War II. And he's, writ he's writing it in Britain. And as you can judge by the topic of tea, it's a very British essay. Mm. So anyone listening to this who isn't British, I hope you're able to understand the subtleties. And if not, I hope you enjoy them and you can look into them further. But... Britain was undergoing a period of strict rationing at yes, this time. Right. So I imagine when he wrote this, he probably felt a little compromised, would you say? Or a little guilty even? Well, what, what, why would you think so? He, he's dedicating his time to talking about a luxury. And I think at, those t at that time, drinking tea was a luxury. It wasn't easy to get hold of tea. Even milk was all rationed. That's true. But um, as he points out in the essay, um, tea was a luxury, but it was it was it was on the ration, and uh, I think he mentions was it two ounces? Let me check. Um, for for anyone reading along, Simon and I are using the Everyman collection of George Orwell's essays, which is a brilliant book. I've had it since I was about eighteen. Yes, you got two ounces of tea a week. I don't actually, I'm, I don't understand um, imperial measurements. I don't either. Um, <laughs> two ounces, though, is not a lot. It's probably less than we've got in that box, in the box over you, there. Yeah. Much less. Oh, we should mention that. We, as we, we'll go through this process that Orwell describes to make the perfect cup of tea, and we've just done it ourselves. Um, yes. To, to a tea, as it to were. To a tea. That's good. Um, <laughs> but I think there should be a, a, a pound jar for every pound. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do we what do we spend money on once we're done? Tea, tea. <laughs> um, or, or costs associated with making a podcast. Um, so a pound, please, sir. Yes, uh, a pound of tea. God, I can't. <laughs> do more, I have to more, put a pound in that? More than you get, more than you get on the on the ration. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but he does met what I went what I meant to say was he does actually mention that old people at that time, pensioners, got an extra ration of tea. Um so yes, it's a luxury, yes, it's um it's rationed, but obviously the British government thought that tea was important uh to to the British people at the time. Well in those times, simple pleasures are magnified, aren't they? And and, and a simple pleasure for the British since the beginning of our days of empire, mm. has been a cup of tea. Right down to the present day. Yeah. I, so. I mean, the, the horses of the apocalypse could be coming over the moors, and we'd still go and put the kettle on. I can imagine my mum and dad. Yeah. Doing that, like, oh, no, the, the apocalypse is coming, love. Get the kettle on. <laughs> We've got a few minutes yet. <laughs> Let's, um, should we talk a bit about tea in our lives? Do you want to do yeah. that? Yeah, let's do that. Simon... In your house growing up, mm -hmm. I mean, were your parents tea drinkers, coffee drinkers? R rid tea drinkers, and ridiculously so. Oh. The, the argument of who has to put the kettle on, make it, it is, is the story of my childhood. <laughs> and and it, it would be based on so many different things, such as, I cooked, so you're on tea. Oh. Or, I won Monopoly, so I don't have to make tea. Well, I made the last three, <laughs> and it was, it was just a constant argument in the household of who made the tea, which shows you how many cups were made in a day. I remember my mum and dad drinking five cups a day, upwards. I'm not surprised. And they worked for most of the day, mm. so they weren't at home. How about you, how, in your household? Growing it's, up? it's much the same. You could measure out my parents' day according to the cups of tea, you know, when the tea was made. First thing when we got in the house, you know, slippers on, you want a cup of tea. Um, every time we got back from the shops, things <laughs> like that. Um, I have heard it said some younger British people, you know, we live in a kind of coffee culture these days and, you know, Starbucks and all of that. Yeah. But I have heard younger British people saying, oh, tea's on its way out. But you know what my feeling is that tea is, it's a constant and it's always going to be there. It's maybe never going to be fashionable. Coffee is fashionable at the moment. Yeah. But I think tea is going to outlast that because I think tea is a necessity as it was when Orwell was writing in Britain. You're right. Like coffee is much more cyclical in its, in its being in fashion. So in the 18th century coffee houses in mm. London were the opium dens of the 18th century. So people would go and they would drink really strong black coffee and talk politics mm. and they'd, they'd get a buzz, you know, that's what they did. Talking more politics than they did in opium dens. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more. And then in the 19th century, coffee drinking declined a bit. And in the 20th century, it was, it, we draw what's, what's the substitute? Chicory. Chicory, mm. that's it. Elzatz. Oh, God. So, yeah, yeah that, they were drinking more of that. My father-in-law drinks that because he doesn't want the buzz, you know. He doesn't want the... He still uh, drinks it. Yes. It, it's quite fashionable now, actually, chicory, for people who want coffee that isn't... Um, it's not got caffeine in it. I don't know. Maybe it's a Russian thing. No, well, maybe it's a Russian thing. little thing I, I wrote down here as well, before we get into the Orwellian perfect cup of tea, I wrote down all the different tea occasions we can have in a single day mm. in Great Britain. Now tell me if you've heard of it right. and if you know what it is. I so, should maybe mention that Simon and I both, we live in Japan, we're in education, um, so we often have to deal, we often hear our students tell us things about our own culture that we don't necessarily recognise and I feel that that's maybe what's going to happen yeah. here. I, I'm yet to wear a bowler hat. <laughs> so, cream tea. I've had cream teas. I've had cream, probably had more cream teas in Japan than, <laughs> yeah. than back home. Yeah, I've seen your Instagram. <laughs> Elevensies. I use, you know what? I really associate Elevensies with childhood, don't you? Not really. It's not something I did, but. I used to get up, because when you're, when you're, when you're a bairn, I'm going to be Scottish and say bairn, when you're a bairn, you, you get up early and uh, you're hung you get up at like seven and then you have your breakfast and you're hungry again by 11. So that's why I associate it with childhood. Okay. 
afternoon tea. Again, it's not like... I think a lot of people think that afternoon tea is something that British people do all the time, but they don't realise it's a kind of special occasion thing. Because the way it worked in my family was we didn't have afternoon tea every day, but if my aunties, and it happens to this day when I go back and visit, if my aunties were coming, my mum would put out a big plate of sandwiches (laughs) and a plate of cream cakes, and we'd all have that. But no one would say, do you want to come round for afternoon tea? It would be just, do you want to come round? And then my mum would serve something similar to afternoon tea. We had tea in the afternoon, but we didn't have afternoon tea. Mm. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. It it might not to (laughs) non-British listeners. (laughs) (laughs) So, of course, we drank tea throughout the afternoon, but it wasn't for a specific marked occasion. Now, how about this one? Low tea. Low tea? Is that like tea eating, I don't know, eating jelly deals and singing musical songs. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it, it's actually from a different class of, of, of society. So low tea, it's the same as afternoon tea, but sitting in low chairs with low tables right. to make the atmosphere less formal. <laughs> sitting in your, in your conservatory. Yeah, maybe. you can take off the bow tie, I think. Yeah. And there's also high tea, where you had to dress up. And sit on high chairs. You know what? I always assumed that high tea and afternoon tea were the same thing. And I think these days they get conflated. I I thought they were low afternoon, high afternoon, early and late. But it's it's nothing to do Mm. with that. Royal tea. That's a Japanese thing, surely. (laughs) No, that's a... Royal milk tea. That's that's British. Royal tea, maybe I should pronounce it like that. I don't know what it is, but it exists. (laughs) (laughs) Celebration tea is when you have a celebratory cake with your tea to celebrate an occasion. That sounds to me like you're reading an old novel, like an old school story, like, you know, Mallory Towers or something like that. Mm. And then the 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 form mistress says, oh, you girls have been so good. We shall have a celebration (laughs) tea. Right then. So less about us and more about Mr. Blair. Yes. So shall we just dive in and go through his 11, 11 pointers in making the perfect cup of tea? Yes. Shall I? Do you want me to pour you some more? Before we start, um, can I just say, I freshened up our cups of tea and... Uh, George Orwell uses this phrase in another essay, um, a mahogany brown cup of tea. That's the kind of tea I like, and that's kind of what we've got at the moment. Um, well, my, mine's a bit milkier, because I like mine with a lot of milk, but yeah, it's good. It's a good cup of tea. Now, let's dive into the essay. Something that stood out to me in the very first paragraph. He's talking about how in a cookery book, you won't find anything on how mm. to make the perfect cup of tea. Now, He says, at most you will find a few lines of sketchy instructions which give no ruling on several of the most important points. Now, a man who was a contrarian (laughs) has rules about making a cup of tea. And it it reminds me of a really funny story I, I heard years back where it was an interview with Yoko Ono. And she was talking about her life with John Lennon. And she would talk about how John Lennon hated any structure in his life. He hated rules. But if she made the cup of tea wrong, he would blow a fuse. And he was like, listen, Yoko, don't mess with my tea. And he wrote down how she had to make it. So even John Lennon, and what we know about him now, was really rule-orientated with his cup of tea. I I was going to say, John Lennon gets angry with a woman. I'm not that surprised. (laughs) (laughs) Right then, so... Anything that sticks out from the opening paragraphs? For you? Actually, from before the opening paragraphs, just that, that title, A Nice Cup of Tea, it's really, um, don't you think it's just such a comforting phrase to someone from, not just a British person, but someone from the Anglosphere? And this is something he, he mentions later, that tea is such an important thing in 
civilization. And, and specifically in, in Britain, yeah. Australia, New Zealand, he mentions Ireland as well, all former, former British possessions. And that phrase, it's a nice cup of tea. It's comforting, it's bland, it's cosy, and it's, but it's also universal. So I think that's something that really struck me and made me think this is pure Orwell because it's something that touches on both the mundane and the the high flown, the the culturally significant, you know? But as culturally significant as tea is in Britain and its former dominions, what about China? Yes. Tea is an essential component mm. of Chinese culture, and he doesn't mention China there. That's true, but I think in this essay, especially because he gets to instructions, in, in yeah. fact, in a way, he, he is providing a cook book or a recipe for tea because he, he's seen a gap in the market, as yeah. it, to use a very neoliberal flip phrase. <laughs> um, but do you think the title should be A Nice Cup of British Tea? No, that, that, that smacks of uh, kind of... Because uh, it, a man reading this in Shanghai is thinking, why on earth are you putting milk in tea? You're right, though. I see what you mean. Yeah. Because the title makes you think of, this is the way to make tea. And, and where does tea originate from? Where did we steal the recipe from originally? Well, you're quite right there. Yeah, China. Mm. But then again, he goes on, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, mm -hmm. he goes on to say that the best tea actually comes from India and yeah. Ceylon. And we're actually drinking uh, some... Other, other teas are available. Other teas are available. <laughs> we're not on the BBC, I think. All right. Yeah, we'll be right. If, if anyone would like... Other channels are available. If, a, if anyone would like to send us a crate of tea, then you know we're prepared to advertise. For well, if we're on the BBC, they certainly won't hear this in China, so they won't be offended no, by no, the no, lack no, of no. his mention of them. But they're not going to let you back in. <laughs> right, let's dive in, Lewis. Are you ready? First of all, coming to your point you just made, one should use Indian or Selenese tea. So that, that's black tea, isn't it? Yes, Assam, that's something. Yeah, thing. it's black tea. China tea has virtues which are not to be despised nowadays. I love that. Not to be despised nowadays. Mm. So, <laughs> what do you think he means by that? Is that purely that people didn't like green tea, or is that a political statement? I think that even to this day, people don't quite understand green tea in Britain. Yeah. Do you, I mean, when I was, when I was working in a warehouse, it was a summer job at university, I used to bring in this bottle every day of green tea. Yeah. And... When my co-workers saw me drinking it, they thought it was the most exotic, bohemian thing they'd ever seen. <laughs> um, this was about this was a decade ago, but I don't think it's changed that much. Also, that tea was sweetened, so I thought myself very exotic and bohemian, but that's not how you drink green tea. I kind of associated green tea with a person who was also going to tell me about the virtues of yoga. Yes. And digesting chia seeds. And antioxidants. And eating yeah. placentas and stuff like <laughs> that, you know. So only since I've moved to Asia have I started to really like green tea and drink it a lot. But back in, when I lived in England, yeah, I just associated it with, with those kind of things. Mm. But something he mentions is that it's not stimulating enough, yes. Chinese tea. Now, you can drink 10 cups of green tea and be okay. You drink 10 cups of Orwellian tea and you're not sleeping for a month. No, but we might stay up all night writing 1984, which yeah. is what, what, what he managed to do. Well, 10 cups of that, I'll be writing 1892 or something. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think one of his, the appeals, obviously, of, of black tea is that it's got more caffeine and it's a stimulant. Yes. Right. Secondly, tea should be made in small quantities, that is, in a teapot. Tea out of an urn is always tasteless. I disagree. While army tea, made in a cauldron, tastes of grease and whitewash. Now, I know you have some... I know you're, this is close to your heart. First of all, tea out of an urn is always tasteless. Why do you disagree? I disagree with both comments. Now... As you know, I come from a military family and I wasn't in the military myself, but I was in the cadets and we would go on exercise and drink tea out of an urn or a cauldron. And it's contextual, Lewis. Mm. 
So when you are on exercise and you've been out in the cold all night, running around, shooting off blanks at people I'm that sorry, don't... I'm doing what? <laughs> well, uh, people that don't exist. And it's cold and it's wet. And then some guy comes over with his urn of tea. That tastes like champagne. It's contextual. So if you bought an urn in now and emptied it into my tin pot, I'd probably despise it. But at the moment, it was lovely. I think this is very much a matter of context. Yeah. Because, again, when was this published? 1946. Yeah. Um, the British public has just had seven years of nasty, quickly made tea in British restaurants, which were these sort of council-run restaurants with very cheap food and um, army tea made out, made in urns and made in cauldrons. So maybe he's starting to, he thinks we need to start getting back to the not the finer things, but we, we need to be a bit less utilitarian. So the war's over now, guys. Let's yes. get the teapots up. Mm -hmm. When would he have drunk army tea? Well, that's a good point because he was never in the British army. And I don't know... If and they wouldn't have drunk tea in Spain, would they? Probably coffee, eh? Um, well, if, if that, in that war, to mm. be honest. But, Moonshine. Um, he was in the Home Guard, so he might have had... That, that might have counted as army tea. Okay. I mean, in Burma, he was in the police, wasn't he? So would they have drunk? Probably quite militarised, of... wasn't it, though, the Imperial Police? I just imagine a lot of gin slings <laughs> for the Imperial Police in Burma. That's for another essay. Though, so. Well, he recommends a teapot made of china or earthenware. Silver or Britannia ware pots produce inferior tea, and enamel pots are worse. What's your views on that? Um, what did we use today? We used a china teapot. China teapot. The main problem I have with metal teapots is that you can't you can't pick them up. They they heat up. Um, Orwell, we're going to come to back to this again and again. Orwell liked cozy domesticity, mm. and I'm hoping one day we're going to read his his essays about having an open fire in your house and yeah. also about The Moon Underwater, which is about his ideal pub. In The Moon Underwater, he writes, beer tastes better out of China. So this is clearly something... Orwell had some kind of affinity for China and he had... I think probably because it's old-fashioned. Old, Chi China where? Clearly not China. China. Where, yes. Um, but I think... Partly because it's kind of, it's cosy, domestic, old-fashioned. Um, again, it makes me think of these British restaurants and uh, army, like, naffy canteens. They were probably using metal teapots. He's being a bit snobbish here, isn't he? I don't why, know. Why are people using a steel teapot? Heat retention, mm. so you can get more out of it, and it's easy to clean. Again, so who's going to be using it? The working class. This is something we're going to return to in Orwell, though. Orwell doesn't believe in convenience. He believes in, uh, God, God help me for saying it, but he believes in orth authenticity. That's convenient. <laughs> so he recommends a china teapot, which we use tonight, and I think we can both vouch for it being it's a decent teapot. Decent teapot. But can you taste the difference? Had I made it in a steel teapot? I wouldn't have said, <laughs> if you had made this tea for me in a <laughs> steel teapot and you'd brought it through to me, I wouldn't have got, oh, God, you Simon. spat it out and go, steel? Did you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Personally, what I do you think, think I am? I have taken a lot of my tea making tips from this essay, but I think the, the make of teapot is optional. Well, thirdly, the pot in question should be warmed beforehand. This is better done by placing it on the hob than by the usual method of swilling it out with hot water. Now, in this day and age, neither is mm. usual, but... We have to remember context, that Orwell yeah. is writing at a time when even the most... even the wealthiest people would have had just gas fires in their... gas mm -hmm. ranges in their kitchens. So, and so he's probably taught, thinking about people making tea with a a proper range, a fire fire in their kitchen. So, Lewis, uh, in the Lewis household, mm. are you using a pot to make your tea? Uh, am I using a like a, a teapot to pour out of? You mean? 
to, to brewery tea. Yes, I'm using a pot. Um, Exclusively. Yes, because again, like I said, I took quite a lot of my tea making tips. I'm, I'm a very impressionable person. Yeah. And if George Orwell says it's a good idea. Do you warm the pot? No, I don't. Do you swirl a hot water inside? No, I don't. Because uh, it's too much work, frankly. And for me, tea is a drink of convenience. Is, is, is there something scientific in this, in warming the pot? It is by the, the water slightly cooling during the infusion process going to affect the taste? You've got a good point there. It, it made me think actually of tea cozies because yeah. I think like our like grandmothers knitted tea cozies and the first time I saw a tea I cozy yeah, yeah. was when I went to my grandmother's house and it wasn't something we had in the house at all. And I, I thought, what is this, this quaint and curious thing? And I, I, I wore it on my head because it was funny. <laughs> Well, I have to be honest. I I don't use a teapot. I put the t I, I tea bag in the cup, hot water in, leave it for three minutes. So maybe because I live alone. That's true. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. But can I just ask? You know, we've made this tea according to Orwell's recipe, and before we started recording, you told me you don't know if you can go back to tea. Yeah, bags. I think my my oohs and ahs weren't suitable for a daytime podcast whilst drinking that cup of tea, but. I mean, I explained to you the truth. I've got 260 Yorkshire tea bags. Other teas are available, exclusively sent to me by my mother, and I need to get those drunk before I convert. But Other teas are available, better. but Yorkshire's really nice, and if anyone wants to send us a crate, that's great. <laughs> or if Yorkshire Tea wants to sponsor this yes, podcast. Yes. Yeah. And as long as we have, can you do a Yorkshire accent? Yorkshire Tea, made at Yorkshire Water. How's uh, that? That's all right, actually. All right. It's better than mine. <laughs> I, I can't do a Yorkshire accent without saying by gum. Mm -hmm. So, Yorkshire tea by gum. What was that famous advert where he's cycling up a hill? Was that Yorkshire tea or Hovis? I think you're thinking of Hovis. Oh, it's the Hovis. old man okay. walking up. And uh, Ronnie Barker did the, um, did did the, the parody sketch. of it where he walked up the hill and said, Granddad always said it was a bloody long way to go <laughs> for a loaf of bread. Somebody might be thinking... This is an awful long listen to learn how to make a <laughs> cup of tea. But, so I'll, I'll move on. Fourthly, the tea should be strong. Yes. Hear, hear. Yes, tea must always be strong. Yeah. Why? Because, um, is this where he mentions actually that tea should leave you feeling, and I quote, wise, brave, <laughs> and optimistic? Is that, have I, have I jumped the gun a bit there? You, you you have, but I think that can be applied to this as well. Actually, to tell you the truth, I'm starting, we've just had a couple of cups of really strong tea, and I'm starting to get a buzz from it. I'm feeling really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we won't throw a brandy in the next one, then? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a waste of brandy. Well, he goes on to explain exact measurements, which I'll, I'll, I'll skip out. But I would I'm... like to mention, though, that... Um, I really do think Orwell um, says you should put six teaspoonfuls of tea in. And we and, did. And, it and we did. And it worked. And I feel great. And I can't stop yeah. talking. <laughs> but I, I'm seeing three microphones right now. <laughs> also, as I said to you before, my dad would be... I remember I once um, put three teaspoonfuls into a pot and my dad came through into... The kitchen and said, Lewis, what the hell are you doing? That tea is practically <laughs> fizzing. Well, he says all, tr all true tea lovers not only like their tea strong, but like it a little stronger with each year that passes, a fact which is recognised in the extra ration issued to old age pensioners. Now, my parents have gotten weaker as they've gotten older. You mean they want weaker tea? They want weaker tea. That's interesting. My, my father's even moved on to decaf tea. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's, I think that's the modern, I don't want to say obsession, but modern concern with health. Though, yeah, right? I think so. Um, but my, my mum, like, with my tea bag, it just touches the surface and she panics. It's in and out. It's like the SAS. <laughs> <laughs> My mum drinks SAS tea. It's in and out. You don't know it's been there. But the job's done. Whereas you and I, like, you know, we're more like World War I tea. It just yeah. Goes, we, should, have, should have been made by Christmas, but it goes on <laughs> and on. 
We we want to drink enough feed to make us brave enough to walk very slowly <laughs> yeah, exactly, towards yeah. machine guns. Yeah, but my mum, I remember back in the day, she'd like it quite strong mm. with a lot of milk. Now like, I put it in, she's like, too long! And it's straight out. But that reminds me very much, I mean, I come from, you and I are really at the convergence of tea cultures, aren't we? Because we live yeah. in Japan, my partner is Russian, we're both British. Um, so my partner's grandmother, again, doesn't drink black tea after midday because she's afraid that when she goes to bed at nine or ten, she'll still be buzzing. Yeah, from yeah. It. but you get used to it. Mm. Go, go in, we just mentioned Japan, so is it a test tube in that's used in the Japanese tea ceremony to heat the tea and to pour the tea? Um, it's, it's made of cast iron, isn't it? Yeah, the cast iron teapot. Tetsu something. How, how do you think? Yeah, I think it's tetsu bin. Mm. How would that work, do you think, with with Ceylon or Indian tea? I feel like you're comparing apples and oranges, to be honest. I think it's worth a go. If you buy the teapot. Well, yeah, well, we could borrow one. Okay, should we move on? Go on. Fifthly, the tea should be put straight into the pot. Okay, so I lived in China. And when I first got there, I bought myself this big bag of green tea, but I couldn't find a strainer. So as I was drinking the tea, I'd be also eating the tea leaves. I grew to really enjoy it, chewing on these swollen tea really? leaves. I grew to really enjoy it. So green even when I had an, a, a strainer, I, I wouldn't use it. Green tea leaves do taste quite nice, though, because mm. here in Japan, you know, there's so much stuff made from matcha. That, that flavour, is it's nice and fresh, isn't it? So I, I, I believe it should just be put straight into the pot and then strained on entry to the cup. However, again, um, as I said, I often, I, I took most of my tea drinking habits from this essay because yeah. I read it an, at an impressionable age and I didn't have a girlfriend <laughs> at the time. And I, uh, so I had to, you know, Orwell was everything to me. <laughs> Putting the tea directly in the pot is another thing I don't do because I find it to be a really grim and grotty job scooping all those loose leaves out of the pot. And Orwell mentions like using a, a how device about to... telling your own fortune? I don't know how to do that. Just make it up. <laughs> Just make people, it up. And impress people that you're with. But no, I find it, I, I don't like the job of like sluicing out loose tea leaves. And so I, I put it into a, like a, Orwell says you shouldn't use a device for, I like the way he puts it, imprisoning the tea. But I do that because it's just so much more convenient. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Orwell. If the tea is not loose in the pot, it never infuses properly. So when you were in China. It's like a free range chicken. Tastes better. When you were in China. Were you, you were scooping out those leaves from the pot every day and you didn't find it tiresome? Oh, I, I would just swirl a bit of water and then throw it down the sink. Down the drain? Yeah. But didn't your drains get clogged? Um, were you thinking, oh, I'm only here for a year, it doesn't matter? Just in case my <laughs> old boss is listening, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> I don't want a, 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 an almighty utility bill to come my way for the replacement of pipes for half a city of China. And half a city of China is pretty big. Sixthly, one should take the teapot to the kettle and not the other way about. Thoughts, Lewis? Yes, um, because I will die on this hill. Um, <laughs> the water should be boiling at the moment it touches the tea leaves. What, what, what are your thoughts about that? I'm with Orwell on this. He says, I have never noticed that this makes any difference. And because I use tea bags, the kettle comes to the cup. For, for practical purposes. Yeah. Seventhly, after making the tea, one should stir it, or better, give the pot a good shake, afterwards allowing the leaves to settle. Common sense. Really. Common sense. Even with a tea bag, you, you dip it in and out, you dab it, you, you stir it around just to get things moving. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? It's kind of logic. So no argument on that. Eighthly, one should drink out of a breakfast cup. That is the cylindrical type of cup, not the flat, shallow type. The breakfast cup holds more. By breakfast cup, we mean mug, right? I think so. Yeah. Um, I'm not being a mug. And pound with... in the jar. Pound in the jar. <laughs> also. 
Uh, and with the other kind, one's tea is always half cold before one has well started on it. How hot should your tea be, Simon? So, Lois, when I'm looking at my cup of tea, I want to be looking into the gates of hell. To the mouth of Mount Stromboli. Yes. I, I, I want to see flames entering. I'm with you there. Yeah. I want my tea barely scalding yeah. when I drink it. I want it to hurt a little. That first sip <laughs> yes. has to hurt a bit, doesn't it? Right? I can tell you went to public school. <laughs> You've got to be really nervous as you put your lips on the yes. cup, and it's a, is it or isn't it? You're testing yeah. the waters. Um, and, uh, no, completely agree with that. Hot as possible. Yeah. Um, what's, your, what's your take on lukewarm tea? So when you, you're drinking out of a big mug, you're halfway down, and it starts to get lukewarm. If I'm drinking tea and I've gotten distracted, and then I go back to it and it's, it's lukewarm or cold, I will... Gulp it down like a glass of brandy, not to enjoy the flavour, but just to, you know, because it seems good for me, Yeah, like medicine. On that, do you ever drink tea back to back? How do you mean back to back? So as soon as you've finished one cup, you put another brew on. Well, again, that, that speaks to the difference between how you and I drink tea, because I often make a pot of tea. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I, I have not mentioned, but I actually... I start my day with tea every day. It's the first thing I consume in the morning with my breakfast. Uh, and um, so if I've made a pot and I'm not drinking with my significant other, I will consume the whole pot myself. Okay, so you do go um, back to back. I do go back to back. How about if you're using tea bags? Uh, no, I don't think I will. I'll, I'll give it a half an hour at least. Yeah, maybe. yeah. I want to, I just don't feel like I should. Why not? It's, you don't eat two puddings. Well, you do, but you feel, oh, I've had one, I don't need another. Tea's a bit, I see what you mean about not feeling like There's no, there's no logical that, reason, yeah. I just feel I should have a gap between. We associate, I suppose especially in Britain, we associate tea with, with a break. That's why yeah. we say tea break, so I suppose. It's, it's, it's a psychological thing mm. as, opposed, as opposed to a physiological. Ninthly. One should pour the cream off the milk before using it for tea. So the essay is showing its age here, isn't it? Yes. Make makeups off. Mm -hmm. The lines and crinkles are out. Yes, um, exactly. Uh, I don't remember. In fact, we never had a milkman. Did you have a milkman? Yeah, I mean, I'm 10 years older than you, and I, I distinctly remember the milkman. So this, um, I mean, I should mention to non-British listeners, this refers to... In the old days, when you got milk delivered straight from the dairy in glass milk bottles, I mean, you remember what it was like, Simon. Well, I mean, the, the the bottles would have a different aluminium covering on, depending on the type of milk. I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember gold meant full fat, mm. full cream, gold and then top, gold top, silver. I think would be semi skimmed, and red or blue would be skimmed. They yeah. still use the colour red for skimmed milk in the supermarkets okay. these days. Okay, so it, it might be that, yeah. yeah. And in those bottles, especially the full fat one, when you, when you took off the top, there would be a layer of cream on the top. So that's what he's referring to. And I used to like dipping my finger in and eating that, nice. that cream. It would also be, I suppose if you had a cat, that would be, the cat would get that if it had been good. Yeah, the cat, they got all the cream. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, that, that, that's a bit anachronistic, doesn't really touch on... Yeah, but what, what, what killed the milkman? Supermarket, I think. Yeah. Exactly the same way that, you know, the supermarket has really brought the dairy farmer. Well, it's, it's killed the high street the as well, hasn't it? Yeah. And um, UHT, like, we can make milk that lasts longer now, so... Am I just being nostalgic, or have we missed out on losing the milkman? You know, it's one of these things that it's been making a bit of a comeback, actually, um, with a Corona a comeback, a yeah. Corona comeback, a Corona um, back. Because I think my parents are actually getting their milk delivered now. They Who's delivering it? I'm not sure, uh, but <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it's somewhat reputable. Hopefully, it's, it's not just turning up. <laughs> yeah, no. they might want to test what's in there. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that it's actually milk. Yeah, yeah. Or from a cow, at least. Mm. I think it's one of those things like shopping, your own shopping baskets or shopping bags that might have to make a bit of a comeback for the sake of, for the sake of society surviving. You, you know how these days we, we have our own shopping bags in the way that they used to have, people used to have their own shopping baskets. Who used to employ the milkman? Was it the dairy? It was the dairy, directly. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure the dairies are quite happy to cut out the middleman now. That's true. L- but on less the, expenditure. On the other hand, the supermarkets have um, really, especially in Britain, milk is so cheap. The supermarkets have taken a lot of the dairy, don't cancel me, dairy man's profit uh, <laughs> away from, from him. It's very dairy of you. Right, so I won't, pound. I won't, I won't milk it. <laughs> Man, you're the cream of the crop with a comment on it. Right, I think our, our, our but, pound jars are going to be overflowing if but, we don't stop uh, this. <laughs> but I wouldn't melt me. <laughs> right then, moving on. Right, and here we come to the, I, I believe, the most important point. Up with Democrat, Republican... Conservative Labour, milk first or tea first? I just do, like Orwell, I do not see the logic in putting the milk into the cup first. Uh, And I think Orwell gives the perfect argument. You want to regulate how strong your tea is going to be. And if you put the milk in first, you have no idea. You you want to look at the colour of the tea, don't you? I once heard that the upper classes... Again, we are British, so class is going to be mentioned a lot in this. The upper classes put the milk in first. The working classes put the milk in after. Is that right? Is it really a class thing? I, I, that's what I've heard. And it might be to do with rationing, like when this was written, and the working classes wanted to make that bottle of milk last as long as possible. What do you do? Milk after. I think it just makes sense. Yeah. Have you ever known anyone who put the milk in first? Oh, yeah. Do you I, still I, speak to them? <laughs> Yeah, but through through glass. <laughs> I'm, gl- I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear there's somewhere where they can. One of those phones anyway. you have to pick up. <laughs> so I remember. I but never. You, if you if you're a milk first person, you're gonna know exactly how much milk per yes. size glass you have to put in. That's fair enough. I just think that it's it's a really weird way to go about. It. Lastly, tea. Unless one is drinking it in the Russian style, should be drunk without sugar. True. 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 Yeah. Um, when I say to you builder's tea, British <laughs> listeners will will their ears will be pricking up. Um what what do you think of? What is builder's tea? A lot tea? of milk, a lot of sugar. True, yes. They need they need that energy. rush, that energy mm. boost to get back onto the site. I used to drink tea with sugar mm-hmm. until I read this essay as a teenager. Yeah, I used to be a sugar drink. Like with coffee and tea, I used to put sugar. Mm. And what he mentions here, and it's very poignant for me when I read it, he said, if you try for two weeks without sugar, you'll never go back. Which is true. And it's exactly what happened to me. Yeah. When did you stop using sugar? So I'm 40 now, late 20s. I started in my, when I was a teenager. I think it's when my, my youth ended. <laughs> the day I stopped taking sugar in my tea, I felt I'd become a man. Personally, I think my youth ended when I was about 14 as well. So. <laughs> Lewis, you were nine when your youth ended. <laughs> <laughs> that was when I, was my first pair of corduroy trousers. You're, you're in 31 year old retirement now. <laughs> I like, he says here, tea is meant to be bitter, just as beer is meant to be bitter. If you sweeten it, you are no longer tasting the tea. You are merely tasting the sugar. You could make a very similar drink by dissolving sugar in plain hot water. And then there's another paragraph hmm. about this. He feels quite strongly about this. What do you think about that comparison of tea and bitter beer? Because you remember how I said at the beginning mm. that I think this essay really encapsulates a lot of what Orwell was concerned with. And I think he often made these kind of slightly unfashionable, even these days, unfashionable yeah. points about 
tea should be bitter, beer should be bitter. It shouldn't all be like hyper sweet and. I don't. I don't see the analogy. I mean, sugar is a complement to tea, whereas bitter, like the type of beer, is a is a component to itself. So I don't really see the analogy. And there's different types of beer. We're not talking different types of sugar to put into tea. Are you with me? I, I don't mm. really like the analogy there. Of I like it because I think it, it speaks to a certain kind of unfashionable but dogged uh, devotion to British culture. Bitter beer, bitter tea. Well, that's a very temporal comment because bitter beer is back in fashion now. When mm. you go to all these craft beer places, it's the the more pungent the beer is, the the more the hipsters get excited. Which comes onto a so, point... So it's no longer the like room temperature mm. bitter is what the real man drinks. There, there you go, there's my Yorkshire accent. It's, but, but it's, um, yeah, it's cyclical and it's in trend. Try drinking tea without sugar for, say, a fortnight, and it's very unlikely that you'll ever want to ruin, ruin your tea by sweetening again. He thinks tea is ruined by just making it sweeter. George Orwell was a man of forthright opinions yeah. who would often say i mean typical journalist in a way he would build up an argument as if this was the truth so they're the 11 points to making the perfect cup of tea as recommended by george orwell we did it before the podcast and it's the best cup of, best cup of tea i've had for years you really think so i for really years? think so i mean I, i'm drinking yorkshire tea by the tea bag in, in the cup and it's good i enjoy it but that was a really good cup of tea. It was, and I feel really energised. Yeah, yeah. You know, I feel like I could build an empire now. <laughs> or, or, you know, defeat fascism. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think George Orwell would probably... Fight Franco. Frank Franco. <laughs> but, well, I mean, they say the British Empire was built on tea. It certainly grew up with the popularisation of tea, didn't it, mm. from the 18th century? Yeah. And it's still with us, much like the legacy of the empire. Exactly. I, I would say on a day-to-day -day basis, it's probably the biggest legacy of empire, isn't it? Like our drinking of tea. Yes, quite, quite right. Yeah. If you, especially if you don't live in an urban centre where you're able to see the more multicultural nature of society now as a consequence of empire. Well, just concluding remarks. Anything else you'd like to add to, to this essay? Something I'd always like to think of when we're reading these essays, do you think this essay is relevant to 21st century life? How many cups of tea do you drink a day? Quite a, quite a, probably as much as my parents, actually. Yeah, me too. And pretty much everyone I know, British, mm. drinks three to ten cups of tea a day. So um, on, on, on that note, yes, it's relevant. On... Being specific with an aspect of culture and really being uh, specific about it, yeah, I think it's still relevant. Yes, I think if you want to understand British culture, mm. I think if you want to understand uh, the importance of tea in daily life in Britain, you, you should read this essay. And if you are interested in like the Second World War, I think this is also rather important because it shows you how tea was really fueling Britain through the war and uh, and this gives you some idea of the importance of tea in the in the post-war period as well. I, I like how subtilized this essay is. Do we do that with anything anymore? Do we subtilize anything in life? Everything now is instant and, and made easy. This is, I, I didn't actually bring this up but Orwell in the uh, essay says that you should a cup of tea mm. should leave you feeling wise, brave, and optimistic. Yeah. And I tried to sort of pick that apart and think, why should it leave us feeling that way? Or, or, or what makes it that way? I think it leaves us feeling wise because making tea is a time for reflection. You, you take some time out of your working day to make a cup of tea. Brave, I mean, it warms us up. Mm -hmm. It's like taking a shot of brandy. It gives you a, a quick hit. And optimistic, it hydrates you. It keeps us alive. You move on to the next thing. So in terms of subtlety, yeah, the one thing that I'm not so sure about is tea as a something that helps you to reflect. 
because these days I think you know our minds are so crowded when I make a cup of tea I'm often you know I've got my airpods in I'm listening to something I'm not reflecting I'm just mechanically making a cup of tea I, I associate tea with a lot of aspects of my daily life I can't work without a cup of tea next to me I can't begin my day without a cup of tea when you come round, what's the first thing I say? Want a drink? Mm. And after we've had the drink, <laughs> we have the tea. we'll have a cup of tea. <laughs> but um, entirely aligned with my everyday being. I would say so too. Tea is, as I said before, tea is the first drink I have in the morning. Tea is uh, something I associate with my family, with my childhood. Well, speaking of your family, let's go into morphology. What's it called in your house? Uh, just tea. Yeah, put, put the tea on. Mm. Cup of tea. I think as um, of the military background to my family, it can often be referred to as a brew. Brew. Put yeah. a brew on. Let's have a brew up. Yeah, get a brew on. Another thing I like about this essay is it's subtle humour, but it's funny. Yes. Orwellian humour is entirely overlooked. Because it's so dry. Because it's so dry. Mm. It's brilliant. You know, you have to look beyond the sentence, but it's... I, I laugh my head off when I read some of these essays, mm. you know? The subtlety of how he, yeah, his dryness and subtlety of, of language and how he uses words. So I think we've done justice to yeah. a nice cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, I think we like it. I think we think it's still relevant. What's your message for the people? Drink tea and drink it strong. And how we've just described. Try yes. it. Give it a go. Give 11 it a go. steps. 11 steps, especially loose leaf. Go for loose leaf. It and really teapot. Makes a difference. And a teapot. Yeah. Um, and, and drink it strong. And you know what? My message to the people is coffee is fashionable. Tea is part of the landscape. Yeah. We'll talk about empire, the legacy mm. of empire and other podcasts. Um, and from my perspective, there are more negative aspects to the legacy of empire. But one positive one is we're all drinking the herb. We are. And... Uh, Yes, let's raise our cups of tea, our mugs of tea, our very large <laughs> mugs of tea to George Orwell. So I think we've discussed that yep. essay. What's that? Um, we, something we also like to do uh, on Orwellian is share. It, it, it's something uh, we like to call the Ministry of Truth. This is where the presenter... The presenter of the essay shares a fact about George Orwell. It could be true, it could be false. The other presenter the other co the other host has to say whether he thinks this is true or false so simon lay it on me okay lewis true or false george orwell had knuckle tattoos the old etonian had knuckle tattoos now this is one of the problems <laughs> ladies and gentlemen with researching separately <laughs> because this was my fact <laughs> <laughs> L ladies, gentlemen, and comrades, <laughs> I should say. That's true. While working as a police officer in Burma, Orwell got his knuckles tattooed. Adrian Fiertz, who knew Orwell, told biographer Gordon Balker that the tattoos were small blue spots, the shape of small grapefruits, and Orwell had one on each knuckle. Orwell noted that some Burmese tribes believed tattoos would protect them from bullets. He may have gotten inked for similarly superstitious reasons. Balka suggested, but it's more likely that he wanted to set himself apart from the British establishment in Bur Burma. I'll go with that. What did you think when you found out George Orwell had knuckle tattoos? Although I was surprised it wasn't something like love and hate <laughs> or, like, <laughs> or poom <laughs> or something like that. I mean, the, the, the reasoning that he just wanted to be contrarian to the establishment in Burma makes sense. Just imagine if he'd, you know, he'd been fighting in Spain. He met a like a Burmese guy who had come over to join the interna international brigades, and he had, he said, "Oh, look, I've got the, I've got my name in Burmese on my arm." And the Burmese guy says, "Mate, that says car park." <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, you've been listening to Orwellian, uh, the George Orwell podcast, with me, Lewis. Myself, Simon. If you've enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Please rate us, review us. You can write to us. We have an email account, uh, orwellpod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. So thanks for listening, everyone. Our next podcast will be about one of my personal 
Bests, one of my favourite Orwell essays, uh, Decline of the English Murder. So tune in next time. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.